Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am delighted to invite you all to the postdoc talk discussion after Janan uh, Ismail's talk yesterday. And um, uh, uh, welcome uh, to both Janan and uh, Jim Woodward, who is the discussant uh, this afternoon. Um, Ty, I would like to now turn it over to you to formally introduce uh, them. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Natarajan. So again, you may recall from yesterday, those of you who had joined us, that Professor Ismail received her doctorate from Princeton University. She was a Mellon Fellow at Stanford and taught at the University of Arizona before coming to Columbia. She's held a number of prestigious fellowships, including an NEH fellowship at the National Humanities Center, a Queen Elizabeth II Research Fellowship from the Australian Research Council, and fellowships from the Templeton Foundation and the Center for Advanced Studies in Behavioral Science at Stanford. Her conversant today is Professor James Woodward, Distinguished Professor in the Department of the History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Pittsburgh. Before coming to Pittsburgh in the fall of 2010, Professor Woodward was the J.O. and Juliet Cupley Professor of Humanities at Caltech. He's a Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and a fellow at the Center for Advanced Study in the Social and Behavioral Sciences, a position he held actually from 2015 to 2016. From 2010 to 2012, he served as president of the Philosophy of Science Association. In 2005, he was awarded uh, an award for Making Things Happen, a Making Things Happen award from the Lakato, sorry, Jim, Lakato's um, uh, award. So we're very delighted to have him and very much looking forward to the post-talk discussion. Uh, the video of this will be available on our Inference Project website in about a week's time. So without further ado, happy to turn, happy to turn it over to you, Jim. Thank you. I would just like to request everyone else to switch off their videos, please, and their audios. Thank you very much. Okay, sh shall I try to uh, uh, get things started by initiating this conversation? Absolutely. Be... Okay, um, so w one of the uh, themes in, in your talk, at least yesterday, at least as I understood it, uh, Janan, was uh, something like the following. There are different ways of approaching the topic of causation and causal reasoning in philosophy. One way, which is associated with um, kind of standard um, uh, analytic philosophy, analytic metaphysics, et cetera, is to ask such questions as what is causation or uh, what is included in our concept of causation? And then you do, if you're doing the latter, you do some sort of conceptual analysis of uh, 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 our concept of causation. But there's an alternative way of approaching uh, the subject of causation. Um, you can ask uh, questions about the role that causation uh, plays in our lives, how um, uh, causal reasoning and causal thinking uh, figures in, uh, so to speak, the psychological economy of uh, uh, human agents. You can ask that question. You can ask the question of what the physical underpinning, so to speak, of causal thinking are, that is, what's the uh, worldly infrastructure or the things that have to be true of the world uh, for uh, causal reasoning to be successful. Um, I would, you, you emphasized, I think, both of these in your talk. I would add a third component, uh, which is more normative in character. There are also questions about um, what are the uh, strategies or procedures uh, uh, that make uh, causal reasoning or learning uh, about causal relationships from certain kinds of data uh, reliable. And if you're doing these latter things rather than the an analytic metaphysics project, things really look, look rather different. Um, there the, are the different uh, criteria uh, for success. The whole focus is different. The focus is more, you know, it's psychological, anthropological. They're, 
if you're interested in the normative aspects of things, there are uh, connections with um, work in statistics on uh, causal reasoning, uh, work in uh, machine learning and AI uh, on, uh, on causal learning, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I, I thought maybe one way we could get started would just to talk a little bit about this, uh, at least as I see it, distinction between um, these two ways of going at um, this general topic of trying to understand causation and causal reasoning. And then uh, there's a further question, which I think is interesting, about whether um, if you do think that there's some merit in this alternative way of approaching things that I'm describing, uh, whether that might be extended to other uh, notions that are of philosophical interest. Right. So I'm in complete agreement with you um, about the latter project. That That's certainly the one that I've been engaged in. I think one of the things that happens when um, you're doing the kind of standard analytic metaphysics approach is that you start with a conceptual analysis with, you know, what, what, what you, what, what causation looks like from a conceptual point of view. And then you look in the world, that is the world as described by physics, and you try to see whether there's anything that satisfies that description. And very often, precisely because the subject and the relationship between the subject and the world has kind of gone out of view, you don't find anything that's, that directly satisfies that description. So I think it's not only that there are these two alternative projects, but there's there's a way in which the former project is kind of bound to fail that comes into view when you're doing the latter kind of project. Um, the part that I didn't talk about, the you know the part where you're treating it as a normative, you're look you're looking for sort of normative guidance about things like you know causal search um, and inference strategies. That's not something that I talked about at all. Um, it is something that you talk a lot about in your new book, which I, you know, and I wonder if, if you don't mind just taking a couple of minutes to talk about that since the book isn't out. Um, and I've had a peek at some of it. I think people would be really interested to hear sort of something about that. Okay, well, well, well thank you. So the book uh, is called um, Causation with a Human Face. Um, uh, normative theory and descriptive psychology, and it's forthcoming with uh, Oxford in uh, the middle the middle of October. Um, and so, what I try to do in the book, it's a, a, a mixture of a, a lot of different things. Uh, but one of the central projects or themes is to try to bring together what I think of as normative work about causation and causal reasoning. And I see this going on, as I said earlier, in statistics and uh, uh, machine learning, machine discovery of um, uh, causal relationships. And I also actually think a, a fair amount of the philosophical work that's been done on causation is really, um, the, the best way to understand it is as normative proposals of various kinds. So there's a certain um, tendency, I think, particularly in analytic metaphysics to think that the a project is somehow some kind of descriptive one, purely descriptive one, that is a description either of our concept of causation or maybe a description of, as they like, people in this tradition like to say, causal reality or what causation is. And I think putting things that way uh, effaces what, what in fact is a, is a kind of normative component, the normative component being that these are actually proposals about how you want to reason and think about causation. They're not just purely descriptive. So anyway, there's this normative um, uh, component that comes out of the disciplines that I just described. And then uh, there's a huge burgeoning uh, amount of work going on in um, uh, cognitive psychology, uh, developmental psychology, uh, to some extent in the animal learning literature, uh, uh, there's work in uh, primatology, um, et cetera, et cetera, which is, and, and to some extent also neurobiology, which is descriptive of, uh, of the sorts of um, uh, things that go on uh, that when people engage in causal reasoning, um, of the kinds of causal judgments people make, the uh, um, uh, procedures, uh, cognitive and otherwise that they go through uh, when they, um, uh, make 
make causal judgments. And one of the things that uh, I try to do in the book is to bring these two literatures together. And one of the ways in which I think they can be brought together is if you're willing to adopt um, what might be described as a kind of rational actor uh, uh, model of uh, uh, causal cognition. And the basic idea here, and this fits with the general theme that causation is this functional notion that we use uh, all the time in our daily lives. Um, the idea is, is that uh, people, um, uh, when, when they engage in causal reasoning, are, are often successful. Uh, they do things that, um, in, uh, at least to some extent and in some respects, are normatively appropriate. So you can, you can then connect the normative and the descriptive by asking such questions as, well, a normative theory says that the appropriate way to reason in such and such a situation is so-and-so. Let's go look and see whether people actually, in fact, reason in that way. And a whole lot of psychology experiments have exactly this form. And you do see um, uh, a certain amount of you know, rationality or normatively appropriate behavior in um, uh, uh, people's causal reasoning. Uh, you can also go in the other direction. If you find people doing um, something regularly, uh, in their causal cognition, and you don't, you have a theory that suggests that it's either completely normatively inappropriate, or maybe your theory says nothing at all about whether it's normatively appropriate at all, then that can provide an impetus to ask the question, well, maybe we should rethink our normative theory a little bit. You know, maybe um, uh, we're missing something uh, uh, in, the, um, uh, in our normative account. So I see these kind of back and forth interactions uh, going on between the um, uh, the normative and the descriptive, um, and so I try to emphasize in the book this isn't a matter of uh, you know deriving an ought from an is or anything like that. Uh, it's rather that the um, if you're willing to make appropriate additional assumptions, like for example the rational actor assumption, then you can you can connect uh, the normative and descriptive. So that's. That is one of the themes in the book. And obviously my focus on uh, the psychology of causal inference is very much uh, in the spirit of kind of putting the subject or the human agent uh, uh, back into the picture. The, the focus is on, uh, at least in part, on what we try to do uh, with causal reasoning, what we're in, um, you know, you know what, we're, what is it, what are the goals? What are the functions? What is it we're trying to accomplish uh, uh, when, when we uh, engage in causal reasoning. So that's, um, uh, that's one theme in the book. Uh, another theme in the book, just, just very quickly, is um, a certain skepticism about the um, tendency in at least a lot of uh, contemporary analytic philosophy to make a very sharp distinction between metaphysics and epistemology. Um, you certainly see this to some extent in of the analytic metaphysics literature on causation and on a lot of other topics where the idea is that what causation is uh, should be uh, understood in some way that's totally divorced from how we might find out about it. And uh, this, for reasons that I, uh, you can perhaps guess that, I won't try to go into them in detail now, that strikes me as a, you know, not uh, a very uh, fruitful way of approaching the subject. Okay, um, so, so another theme in, in your um, discussion in your, uh, yesterday, uh, Jeanne, was what might be called the, uh, the worldly inter underpinnings or the physical infrastructure that uh, underlies uh, uh, causal reasoning. And you, I take it you emphasize in particular the, uh, the role of, uh, you know, something like uh, 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 thermodynamic uh, gradients and, and so on, and, and the way in which um, uh, human agents are situated in, in time and, and in this uh, entropy uh, uh, gradient. Um, could you say a, a little bit more about that? And maybe also just about the whole project of um, talking about um, uh, physical uh, uh, underpinnings. I, I myself have some thoughts about that and I'm I'm actually working on a paper with some other people uh, in connection with that. But it's a, I mean, I think it's an interesting project and it's obviously again, rather different from asking uh, 
well, what belongs to the concept of causation and what doesn't. It's more like, you know, what are the preconditions that have to be present in the world <laughs> for uh, causal reasoning to be possible and successful? Right. Yeah. So the way, I mean, the way it sort of comes up in the philosophy of physics literature is that for some time, just, you know, in the, in the kind of con in the course of doing physics, it became clear that there were these high level generalizations captured in thermodynamics um, that had to be in some way reconciled that because they incorporated temporal asymmetry had to be in some way reconciled with the underlying time symmetric physical laws. And what it means to say that the underlying laws are time symmetric, it means that for any physically possible trajectory that goes from, you know, from a state at time t1 to a state at time t2, there's a physically possible reverse of that trajectory. So one that goes from, from state s2 at t2, uh, sorry, from s2, which is the final state in the original, to the initial state in the original. But of course, we look around us and we see all sorts of temporally asymmetric pr processes. It became uh, sort of widely accepted that all of the temporally asymmetric processes that we actually see are the ones that are captured by the second law of thermodynamics. There's some, uh, there might be some wiggle room about that, but they capture by far the largest body of temporally asymmetric physical phenomena in the world. So the project of reconciling the second law of thermodynamics with the time symmetric underlying laws was for a long time, just a straightforward physics project. One that took a long time, there were a lot of kind of missteps in the early history of thermodynamics, but probably in the last 50 or 60 years, it really became, started to you know, come into focus. Okay. Now, when we look at agents and in particular, the first person kind of perspective on the world from the point of view of an embedded agent, we find two very striking asymmetries that are kind of pervasive from a first person point of view. One is the asymmetry of knowledge and the other is the causal asymmetry. The asymmetry of knowledge is this idea that, um, you know, we remember the, sorry, we remember the past. We don't remember the future. We know more about the past. We, than we do about the future. It takes some time to actually give a precise characterization of these. We take that as a rough and ready go. The other one is obviously the causal asymmetry, the idea that we think that from a first person point of view, we think that we can affect the future by acting some way in the here and now, but not the past. And the question arose quite naturally, um, uh, are those in some way connected? To the asymmetry of thermodynamics. Right, so, but um, a quick question though, uh, Janan. Um, you know, the, <clears throat> there's a fundamental difference between the past and the present in, in, in terms of access to information, right? right. That, um, and that you cannot circumvent no matter what, right? And that's of course tied to the directionality of time and so on. But I mean, is it useful to see it as about being about information rather than entropy, or are they interchangeable? I, I'm just curious. Um, so, I'll, I mean, these were the questions that people were asking, right? So um, the, the, I think the most illuminating way to understand it is to think in terms of, of what kind of information is there available in the world for an agent of the kind that has access to its local environment to use. If you ask the question that way, then you do, you do get a natural answer. And the natural answer is something like this. Right? So if you're just looking at the macroscopic structure of the world, I mean, this is the one I went over very quickly during the talk, but the slightly more detailed answer is this. If you're looking at the macroscopic structure of the world, and you assume that an agent only has sort of whatever you think direct access is, and you think there's some sort of direct perceptual um, that, that is, there's some basic notion of information that, that comes from some sort of causal channel with the world um, on, on the part of an agent. Those are the perceptual channels. If you take information that's coming through that channel and you ask yourself, what can an agent in a generic physically, you know, a generic world that obeys the Newtonian laws, what can an agent like that know about the rest of the world? What can an agent that has that kind of, you know, contemporary, contemporary, 
um, causal contact with its own local environment parlay into in terms of knowledge of the rest of the world, assume just to be, um, I mean, in, you know, to make it a kind of in principle question, assume it knows the physical laws and ask what can it infer from local information about its environment. So you say, um, what can it infer as a matter of physical law, almost nothing. You know, everything that it can infer depends on what's going on in other places. It depends on, um, you know, we know as a matter of physical law that the total state of the world at one time, if it's known, um, can allow an agent that knows the physical laws to, to know everything about the past and the future. But we also know that anything less than that, it can know almost nothing, right? Um, but, but now if you take, uh, the statistical postulate of thermodynamics, you know, the kind of the ordinary canonical probability distribution that the world is in a given microstate, given its macro state, and you add that, and now you ask, well, what can it know from the physical laws together with probability distribution? Again, the answer is almost nothing. If you think about it carefully, you'll see, well, of course, that's because if I'm just looking at my local environment here, and I'm asking what's going to happen a day or a month from now, everything depends on the exogenous influences that are going to impact between now and then. I mean, literally everything. You can take any state, you know, at any finite fraction of, uh, or take any event, sorry, at any finite fraction of an interval into the future, you can find a solution to the physical laws in which that event happens and that event doesn't. And you just by putting the right exogenous influences in. Same in the backward direction. And you know it's going to be the same in the backward direction because the laws are time symmetric. But if you add a low entropy initial state, a low entropy state sometime in the distant past, things change completely. Now, anything, now an agent that's situated looking at its local macroscopic environment, who has access only to the macroscopic states of things around it, can know a whole lot about the past. Why is that? Because for any or semi-ordered state of its environment, given a low entropy past, you know, a low entropy state in the distant past, it can infer a lot about what happened um, between that distant past state and the state of the system. Now, that's kind of, that's the physical underpinnings um, of what's going on when you look at a state like, you know, uh, uh, you know, a scar in a tree trunk or a footprint in, a, in the sand or, you know, a half, a half empty, a half melted um, ice cube in a glass of water. What you're doing is effectively you're inferring from its current state and knowledge that it must be decaying from some lower entropy state in the past um, that at some point somebody put, you know, it was in a more ordered state than it is right now. So that's what that's what's really going on in connecting sort of the entropic gradient with the kind of information that's available to an agent to use and you know to kind of parlay into information about what's going on at other times. Patently time asymmetric has more to do now. I mean, it, 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 that's the step that that lets you go from something about entropy to something about knowledge or information. Did that answer your question, Priya? Yeah, uh, thank you, yeah. Um, now I've forgotten what the thread was that we were talking about. Yeah, well, the, uh, in general, the, uh, the worldly in underpinnings of uh, uh, oh, right. successful okay. causal reasoning and uh, inference. Um, I would want to add uh, some other uh, possibilities that I think are uh, maybe also part of the world, the underpinnings. And I don't myself understand very clearly how these might be related to um, the thermodynamic gradient and entropy increase and so on. Um, and, um, you know, perhaps you, you might help me with that. So one general uh, uh, feature, which seems to be uh, present in, uh, in our world and, and is incorporated in a whole lot of physical reasoning is some sort of notion of uh, the, uh, the effective independence often enough of uh, incoming uh, physical uh, in, in, in incoming influences, so to speak. So we don't, for example, you know, if you're, if you have a, uh, uh, an accelerating uh, electrical charge, you imagine uh, that it will uh, 
uh, radiate uh, outwards with a, with a uh, you know a spherical uh, wave of electromagnetic radiation, you don't imagine that you're going to see uh, uh, such a wave front uh, uh, coming in from a distance and collapsing on itself uh, uh, into a point. And and the idea is that the in the second case this would require some you know fantastic level of coordination between what we think of as uh, uh, independent uh, uh, causal influences and that, uh, you know, at least in most cases, um, you know, uh, uh, doesn't happen in nature. Now, in that, for, in that particular case, I take it that there is some sort of connection with the, um, uh, the same kind of physical reasoning that, that under pins the second law of uh, thermodynamics and so on, the, you know, the kinds of assumptions that Boltzmann made about, uh, you know, uh, uh, uncorrelated lists of molecular motions immediately prior to collision and so forth. You can see, see the connection there. But, but I think that's just one of the things that uh, is, is among these underpinnings of physical reasoning. And a couple of other things that um, strike me as um, also present uh, are the following. Um, one is simply that a lot of physical systems have a certain kind of modularity to them in the sense that you can, um, you don't really have to take into account everything <laughs> uh, in uh, what's going on in the external environment uh, in understanding uh, uh, their behavior. And um, th this is probably, and probably the right way to think about this is it's a kind of uh, you know, in, in, the, in the physicist jargon, jargon, a kind of effective independence or effective modularity. It isn't that the uh, external influences aren't there at all. Uh, it's just that they're very small and they can be neglected, or maybe if they uh, need to be taken um, into account, uh, they can be taken into account uh, just by talking about some very small number of uh, variables and parameters that are on the you know, that you think of as on the boundary of the system. Um, you don't have to model everything in the environment in detail, in other words, to get the behavior of the system. So and it just seems that a lot of physical systems in our world are like that. Um, another uh, notion that strikes me as important is, is um, the presence of what I have called in a couple of papers, um, uh, approximate uh, realization independence or approximate uh, conditional causal uh, independence, where the idea is that at least for um, many systems, um, you don't have to know the details of the physics all the way down to um, uh, understand their macro behavior. So um, um, uh, Leo Kadanoff and uh, Nigel Goldenfeld give the example of uh, modeling the behavior of a bulldozer. And they say, well, you don't need to uh, uh, bring in quantum chromodynamics to uh, uh, understand the behavior of a bulldozer. Um, you can model it at, you know, at, at, at a much higher level. Now you could imagine an alternative world in which uh, to model anything at all, you had to understand the physics at the very, very deepest level. And of course, that would be a world in which would be very difficult to do, uh, to do science or learn about uh, 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 relationships in nature. But our world doesn't seem to be like that. There's a kind of, you know, a de proximate decoupling often between um, uh, different scales. Um, and I think that's also uh, uh, something that facilitates uh, a cause of reason in our world. And I'm not sure, um, exactly how these are related to the second law. It isn't obvious to me that they all just sort of fall out of the second second law. And I wonder if you have some thoughts about that. Okay, so there's a lot there. Uh, so first on the, um, the microscopic sort of chaos and macroscopic order. So that's the full statement actually of the past hypothesis. So you assume that it's a low entropy initial state. So there's macroscopic order. But other than that, you assume uncorrelated uh, micro condition. Okay. Um, on the modularity. So this is an interesting. But can, uh, I, can I just stop you for a second sure. in, in connection with the past hypothesis? And I have to admit, I've never quite understood the ins, ins and out of that. Um, you know, if you're just, you know, modeling the behavior, you know, of a gas or something that it's the non-equilibrium state and it's going to equilibrium, it doesn't seem like you have to bring the 
paths hypothesis directly into the picture. You, all you have to do is to talk about the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, the, st the uh, state of the gas uh, at the moment, and, and then you make, um, you know, assumptions about uncorrelatedness or, uh, you know, equal probability over all the microstates consistent with the macrostate and so on and so forth. So that's in inferring its future and in inferring yeah, yeah. its past, you need the past hypothesis. Okay, okay. So right. if you know, just think of it in time symmetric terms, because the laws are time symmetric, probability postulate is, is time symmetric. So if you take those things and evolve them forward, you're going to get exactly the same result as if you take those things and evolve them backward. So if you if you didn't have the past hypothesis, you ought to infer not only that the system, if it's a gas with you know partly partly collected in one corner, you have to infer not only is the system just running the dynamical laws forward, going to go to an increasingly dispersed state. You have to, inferring backward, assume that it's also coming from a dispersed state so that it, in fact, is collapsing um, into a lower entropy state. It's just a chance fluctuation. The probability distribution yields that. So the past hypothesis is an hypothesis that when you're inferring that, when you're kind of retrodicting rather than predicting, it's a brute postulate that gets you the right state in the distant past. Right. Um, so I'll, I'll just say one more thing that connects with our previous um, the talk about information. That's also needed to get things like that a semi-ordered state of the environment is in fact a record of some, a, a more ordered state in its distant past. Because otherwise, the right thing to say when you see a footprint is in the sand is not that someone stepped there, but that in fact it was a chance fluctuation from um, a, a, a beach at higher entropy. That's the idea. Yeah, I don't, I don't know to what extent our audience is interested in the status of the past hypothesis. And as I say, I'm certainly no expert. Um, but I have to say that one of the things that I, I find a little puzzling uh, about the kind of inference that you just described is that it, it, it sounds as though you, it, the claim is that we have to assume the past hypothesis if we're to take um, what appear to be records of the past, uh, you know, as reliable uh, uh, at all, but I take it we we do have records of um, uh, the early universe. Um, we think anyway that we have some kind of physical understanding of why it's plausible that the early universe was in a low entropy state, and this has to do with complicated considerations about. Uh, the role of gravity in uh, 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 the very early universe. So it, it sounds as though we, 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 we in, in, at least in cosmology, and I'd actually be interested in what Priya thinks about this. Um, we think that we have information about the past of the early universe and its low entropy state that is, um, uh, it, 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 it seems like we're, we're assuming we have kind of some kind of independent access to that that doesn't uh, require uh, use of the past hypothesis. Can I say something about that? <laughs> yeah, so maybe I'm yeah. just confused, that, but that's my reaction. So I wouldn't put it in epistemic terms. That's certainly the way that, that Albert presents it. This is something that we have to suppose in order for our records to make sense. I would say rather, Look, we live in a world in which records are possible because the world started out in a low entropy state. And That's all of the things fun. that you're talking about are inferences from current state. From the current state. Yeah, I agree with Janan. I think that would be the point of view that I would take too, yeah. Okay, well that, I mean, that that is fine with me. That makes perfect sense. Uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned. So one way to see it is to say, look, if we found out that there was no past hypothesis, we'd need to find new foundations for all of those inferences because records would no longer be underwritten. The right inference to, to, to um, the right inferences to make from everything that we see will have been undermined. How would we find out that there is no past hypothesis? Presumably, wouldn't that require somehow finding out that the uh, universe apparently wasn't in a low entropy state, or at least wasn't in the kind of low entropy state uh, that is described by the past hypothesis. And wouldn't that in turn uh, require already taking seriously our records of the past? 
we would, I mean, all of this is just making explicit that on which all of our theoretical knowledge rests. Any inference from present data to what it tells us about the past in one way or another rests on the past hypothesis. So when I said, you know, if we found out, I meant if you released your commitment to the idea that there was a past hypothesis, all of those inferences would no longer be underwritten. It's like you have a source of information. So this is the right way to think, or at least the way that I think of it, um, is, is making explicit the commitments, the physical commitments on which your reliance on records rests. And all of our theoretical knowledge of the, you know, all of our, the, the information, not only, you know, our direct inferences about the past, but, um, but the things that we treat as the evidence for our theories depends on being able to read the macro state of systems as records of their past. Yeah, I, I guess, I mean, one question I would have in this connection is how, I, I understand that, when, that, that if the universe were in its past in a very different state than in fact it was, uh, we wouldn't have records at all or they wouldn't be accurate, or we wouldn't have human agents, et cetera, et cetera. But I guess the question is how sensitive the kinds of inferences you're describing are to the exact details of the past hypothesis uh, that that's yes. what, you know, yeah. uh, um, I mean is there I mean you know I mean and if the, I, I take it if the universe uh, somehow began or was in, in, in a very, very early state in, in, of a complete thermodynamic uh, equilibrium then uh, we wouldn't be here uh, 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 et cetera et cetera there would be nothing that uh, would be recognizable as of any interest anyway, as a, as a, as a record, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the fact that, it, that the universe began in a low entropy state or didn't begin in a complete um, you know, equilibrium state, that seems a, a little more generic than the kinds of assumptions that go into the vast hypothesis. Priya, did you want to? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I... I don't know if um, there, there are alternatives actually in terms of um, just the frameworks that are available for calculation. Um, um, I don't really know what we would, um, what alternatives we would have if we didn't start from that generic uh, assumption. Well, I'm, I'm not challenging the generic presumption. I was just wondering about the whether we have to assume anything as specific as the uh, past hypothesis in the, the David Elbert sense. It's not that specific, actually. Yeah, I think it's, a, it's a, I find it a little more sweeping, um, the, the past hypothesis. And, and I, uh, and I know I agree with uh, Janan's way of phrasing it rather than um, David's. Um, <clears throat> but I think, Part of the, you know, I, I, you know, tried. One can think about it in sort of the counterfactual, right? So, what would have happened? I mean, the thing is, you immediately run aground if you did not start from this. So, you know, the counterfactual way is not an effective way to understand this in this case, right? Because you very quickly will reach the point of the so you know we wouldn't be here to ask this question if that you know this this okay. that had not happened, right? So, yeah. And the very theories that we use to, um, you know, sort of guide our sense of those sorts of counterfactuals is itself based on theory, uh, based on um, evidence, inferences from which rests on the past hypothesis. So That's everything right. would be up for grabs. And yeah, I was going to say then everything becomes, yeah. you know, up for grabs, right? So, yeah, I, I, it, it's it, it's a hard one. I mean, this is a really difficult uh, question. So. I mean, one, one way to ask it would be, and this, I mean, this isn't a, at all implausible that, you know, sort of uh, our theoretical knowledge progresses to, um, to a stage where we now have a, a very specific idea of what kind of initial state that the universe was in. I think what Albert is doing is saying, in order to underwrite 
the sorts of asymmetries that are embodied in our causal reasoning and our inferences to the past and something. We need something that looks generically like a state of macroscopic order um, in the past or some sort of boundary condition that will restrict the states in the past in such a way that those inferences will, will be underwritten. Yeah, you need a curtailment of the number of possible states, initial states from which you could start. I, they could be a set, it doesn't have to be unique, but I mean, they could be a set of them. But I think um, I find it quite difficult to understand even how we could explore the what that set could be, because you very quickly run into the, um, um, uh, moving forward that, you know, uh, we wouldn't be here to question blah, 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 for many of even those other possibilities, right? So it's pretty hard to delimit that set as well. Does that help, Jim? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know whether we want to continue on this topic, but I guess one of the things that, that strikes me and, um, I, I talk about this in the, that paper on the flagpole that you may uh, know about, is that if in, for example, uh, recent work in machine learning on um, calls, learning causal direction. So, uh, you know, the, 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 the paradigm is something like this. You have two correlated variables. Um, you have purely observational data that shows that they're correlated. Um, you can somehow exclude the possibility that they have a common cause, but you don't know whether X causes Y or Y causes X. Um, even in that uh, apparently uh, very unfavorable unfav setting, uh, there are in fact um, uh, algorithms and strategies that will allow you to infer uh, causal direction with a fairly high level of reliability. And what these procedures do is that they uh, exploit the fact that uh, in this kind of setup, uh, there is almost, it's, at least in a whole lot of cases, it's going to be possible to find an additional variable, uh, call it Z, which for example, may be uncorrelated with X, but correlated with Y, or alternatively uncorrelated with Y, but correlated with X. And then you can exploit that fact to reach the correct conclusion about causal direction. So the, the, um, uh, cor the correct uh, direction is the direction in which you have a, you know, a sort of a, um, a collider type structure in which the, uh, the two uncorrelated variables are causes and the, uh, uh, of, 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 the, uh, of, the, of the other variable. Now in that, kind of setup, you're, you're exploiting uh, the fact that there's um, a certain amount of uncorrelatedness or <laughs> exogeneity uh, out there, but it's all very local. You're not, um, you know, bringing, now, now maybe, in, you know, at the end of the day, it all depends on the past hypothesis. I don't know, but you're certainly not um, uh, kind of directly uh, making use of anything like the past, past hypothesis, so, you're making use of stuff that is very, as I say, very, 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 very local to the uh, system that you're um, uh, 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 reasoning uh, uh, about. And um, I, I guess I just think it's of interest to try to understand how those inferences work and what their, what their warrant is and what they assume about what's uh, true of the systems that uh, uh, you're using this methodology to investigate. Um, and you can do all of that, I think, without uh, necessarily bringing the past hypothesis into the but picture. Let me, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, Janan, may, may I ask a question from the audience? It's one I was wondering about too, from Paul Geha. Um, how is the past hypothesis different from the second law of thermodynamics? Would both of you please explain? Can I, um, can I say something just before I lose this head back? Sure. I mean, one thing that you have to keep in mind, and I, I will come back to that question. Okay, thank you. Um, Jim, is that, that, you know, when people are in looking at, for foundations of thermodynamics, in particular, the kind of project that um, Albert's engaged in, um, we're dealing with deterministic laws. So any assumption that you can state in local terms will ultimately be statable in terms of, Kind of first principles from initial conditions. 
So in a way, what he's trying to do is chase those assumptions back. What he calls it the mother of all, you know, sort of assumptions that you need to make to generate all of the sort of local. I mean, the, the aspiration is, though, I don't I mean, you know, if you ask me to give you a proof that it's going to work this way, but the aspiration is it's going to be a single assumption that's going to underwrite all of those more local inferences. So what you're asking is, well, I don't see that in all of these more local inferences, we're actually making any necessary reliance on the past hypothesis. And I'm saying, that might be true as a matter of psychological fact and as a matter of practice, but what, what Albert is trying to do is precisely look at all of, all of the kind of local assumptions that we make and that underwrite things like inferences from records and scientific practice and see if we can chase those all the way back to a single assumption about what the initial conditions were like. And it's gonna be, there's gonna, there ought to be, I mean, it's, it's, it's contingent whether there's some simply statable um, principle about the initial conditions that will do that, but there's gonna be some, assumption about the initial conditions because the laws are deterministic in this regime um, that we'll be able to capture all of those, what, what you need to underwrite all of the local inferences. Yeah, I mean, I guess the only thing I would say is that if uh, David Albert wants to make claims like that, then uh, with all due respect, you should actually be looking at um, these local procedures in detail and then telling us in some detail how they're uh, connected to the past hypothesis. Uh, and I, I, I'm not claiming that that is uh, uh, impossible at all. I'm just saying that, uh, well, there's a project there and, and how um, that might be done is not, uh, at least to me, uh, 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 straightforward. And again, we should I- should answer I, the question of the, the person and then we'll, because there's so much more to say about this and I, I, my inclination is to come back and say more, but we should also ask, answer the question that the... No, well, I haven't been looking at the... What was it, Ty? Sure. Um, how is the past hypothesis different from the second law of thermodynamics? Uh, do you want me to answer that? Or... Please, you or both? Yeah, I'll, do it, I'll do it quickly. It's, um, so second law of thermodynamics says that no system decreases in its entropy. The past hypothesis is an hypothesis that is supposed to generate the second law of thermodynamics in conjunction with the, fund, with the um, Newtonian mechanical laws and the statistical postulate. Does that answer the question? Good. Uh, Paul, did you wanna type anything else out? Right. Okay. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so Jim, before, so now I am gonna come back and say, in fairness to David Albert, I mean, this stuff is all, um, this stuff is all, very much in progress. And what David was trying to do was to, to make explicit, you know, at, a, at what's really a very preliminary qualitative level, but much better than anybody had done before, the kind of thing that you need, um, you know, to, to at least get going on something that looks like um, it would underwrite retrospective as well as prospective. Uh, inferences. But you're absolutely right. And I think he would be happy to acknowledge that ultimately the goal is to try to understand all kind of, you know, reasoning um, in terms in, in terms of something that we can connect directly and explicitly to, um, to the causal asymmetries captured in thermodynamics. It, what, what's surprising about thermodynamics is the degree to which an incredibly diverse uh, you know, body of phenomena, all of the temporally asymmetric phenomena you see when you look around, you fall under the scope of the second law. If, if you can, you know, sort of understand even in qualitative terms, how the second law can underwrite something like causal reasoning, which does have built into it, maybe the most fundamental kind of, of uh, temporal asymmetry, then, um, then you've done something. And that's what he was trying to do. Priya, what about yeah. What about the other uh, candidates for physical underpinnings uh, that I mentioned? Like right, I wanted to modularity, get to modularity and, and realization independence. Do you see those also as? Uh, no. I, so let me actually. So, but first, Priya, you came up for a second. It seemed like you might have something to add here. No, 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 not at all. I was just nodding in agreement. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so, uh, so I, 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 now we are leaving David. I don't know what he 
thinks about this. The modularity question is one that I have found um, very interesting. And so I'm just now going to give completely speculative uh, idea, sort of musings on that. So one thing to say is it's for sure true that just looking around us, you know, the systems that we actually see, and I'm not going to say in our universe, but those systems that we see around us in the biosphere are not a random selection of all physically possible systems that there are. So you're absolutely right that there's no reason that just looking at the fundamental laws, they should exhibit the kind of modularity that we in fact find in many of the systems around us. And moreover, those tend to be the kinds of systems that are targets for scientific explanation and that are moreover, you know, targets for the things like, you know, the formulation of laws, or at least the, you know, the searching for dynamical regularities in their behavior. We do not try to sit down and write down the dynamics of Janan's right thumb and Priya's earlobe and, right, we don't do that. So the real question is why looking around us, do we find all of these kinds of, do we A, find systems like that? You know, um, and at a much higher proportion than you would expect if you just thought that, that the systems around us were a random selection of possible configurations of matter. In the biosphere, the obvious answer is that there's a lot of evolutionary pressure towards stable, you know, finding systems that... Right, so uh, there's a contingency, right? There's an evolution. It's all contingent on evolutionary outcomes, right? Um, right. So if you imagine, I mean, you know, you imagine the world is throwing up complex systems of all kinds. Most of those are going to disperse. Some of those are some, some combination of self-organization and selection is going to generate systems that because of the regularity they exhibit and the fact that they, they largely manage to, despite the kind of onslaught of exogenous influences to which they're subject at any given moment, manage to maintain their internal integrity and do what that they need to persist. Those are the systems that we're going to find around us. But um, yeah, quickly to um, to ask for a clarification, but, but Janan, isn't there implicit in the way you phrased it, the fact that evolution, whatever, there were multiple, potentially an infinite number of outcomes. And because of evolutionary pressure, only some particular ones have survived. But that does not mean that all those outcomes were not manifested. They've just not survived in time. They, they've not persisted, as you said, right? But the other outcomes might well have, I mean, we have to leave explanatory room for the fact that each one of them, all the possibilities were manifest, right? right. We, don't, um, we don't know otherwise. I mean, well, we know it's finite and it's not infinite and so on and so forth, but... Um, um, yeah, I'm, I find, I'm finding it a little confusing. Like if we ask the question of the biosphere, should we just retreat and say, well, every possible state for a system like a plant that evolves, like, you know, the fig tree that looks like this today, there were many, many, there were an infinite variety or a finitely large number of variety in which you know, fig leaves were made and then they just did not survive the evolutionary pressure. So when we talk about outcomes and things, should we say that everything is possible or, I mean, should we operate from that basis or should we already operate from the fact that, that we have an explanation, there's some explanatory power in evolution, that not all possibilities were actually actualized and only finite number or one or whatever yeah, I, to me, it seems like that's a fundamental uh, distinction you want to make because if one of them allows, it's almost like anything goes explanatory power and the other is like a very directed uh, particular kinds of explanatory power. Um, am I being confused about something else? I, I don't know. I, I'm sort of going around in circles trying to see how we would, how we need to see the setup. Tim, did you have something? Oh, well, I, I, I mean, I do think that, you know, looking at the matter from the point of view of a biologist, the, the biologist does have some sort of conception of what's biologically possible. 
and it's it's a, it's a smaller subset than uh, uh, the set of all uh, 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 physical possibilities. So I, th I mean, there I think I I mean that's just part of I take it what you know how the I mean the biologist may not regard him, himself or herself as restricted to the forms of life that um, have actually ever existed in the past because you know there's certainly a lot of current work in biology involves, you know, creating new biological structures that have never existed in the past. But I think there is some sort of uh, broader constraint having to do with um, biological uh, possibility. And, and, and it's a more constrained set than uh, just what's physically possible. So, but to get back to the, the question of, um, you know, why do we find modular systems? Um, I, I agree that part, in, in nature, I think part of the answer to the question is that insofar as we're concerned with biological systems, it has a whole lot to do with uh, the operation of natural selection. And I think that's actually connected to the uh, issue about realization independence too, because um, these systems, um, typically the, um, uh, the features of their environment that are important for, um, you know, purposes of survival and reproduction are at least somewhat macroscopic or coarse grained uh, uh, features of the environment. And so the organism is sensitive to those and maybe not to more fine grained details. And that means that in modeling the organism, we only have to look at the <laughs> coarse grained features of the environment and uh, coarse grained features of, of the organism itself rather than more fine grained details. So, you know, if I, uh, if I'm a, uh, uh, an early hominid, uh, I want to be responsive to the fact that there's a, uh, a large predator uh, nearby me, uh, but I, uh, I don't have to make fine grained discriminations about the uh, exact configuration of the molecules in, in that uh, Siberian tiger or whatever it is. Uh, uh, that is approaching me. And then in addition to that, there, you know, there are things about stability and so on in the, you know, in the, you know, in, 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 in the human nervous system, you don't want um, uh, the operation of our brains to be incredibly sensitive to, uh, you know, small uh, 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 quantum mechanical fluctuations and so on and so forth. And so we have, you know, natural selection has ensured that that's not the case. So in, in, the, in the case of biological organisms, I think you do have a story about natural selection, also just about, you know, the, our, our size, as it were, uh, uh, that, that our scale that, that um, uh, uh, explains why you get some kind of modularity and realization independence. It might be that the correct story about those things for non-biological systems has to be a little bit different. I don't know. Can I add something to that, though? Because it, it, it nests right with what you were saying. If you ask, and this is something that I wondered about for um, a while, too. If you ask, is there some increase in fitness that one would get by being able to see right down to the microscopic fabric of the world, and in particular, epistemic fitness. Would it add to my ability to predict macroscopically if I had microscopic rather than merely macroscopic access to the systems in my environment? It turns out for reasons that are directly connected to the past hypothesis that the answer is no. And the answer is no precisely because of the microscopic case. So one of the interesting and important and profound things and, and surprising things about thermodynamics is the one that you pointed to. There's no reason to think from first principles that there should be any kind of prediction at the macro level that wasn't sensitive to microscopic. The fact that there are, that there, there are laws of thermodynamics, that is we can, formulate ma macroscopic generalizations that are insensitive to the microscopic underpinnings is surprising, but it also means, because it means that they're robust in the face of, of, of you know, whatever's going on microscopically, but it also means that those are the very generalizations that we rely on to predict the future. So having more information about the microscopic um, state is not going to be parlayable, so to speak, into increased macroscopic prediction about the future. 
Right. And, and so you are arguing that the, this is why sort of the modularity, this is where the modularity comes in, that you don't really need to know to have descriptions for every possible micro at the microscopic level for any sort of macro right. phenomenon. Right. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, that's clearly true. And I get that um, uh, the kind of reasoning you were describing, Janan, has a role to play in that. Um, but I'm wondering if, the, I guess I'm wondering if that's the whole, the whole story. Uh, Almost I mean, certainly it, not. No, I think- Why doesn't it have something to do with the character of the uh, uh, the generalizations themselves at uh, uh, the different levels. Okay, so you know, I, I'm I mean, sure. No, no, no. I, I think you're you're assume, you're thinking that everybody who's in this in the discussion about thermodynamics that it's far more developed than it is. I mean, it's it's really everybody knows that that there's so many things that we're only just beginning to get a bit of a qualitative grip on. Um, but you're right. I mean, even understanding that the, the, the target general, you know, the target explananda, much less the precise nature of the thing that's going to be doing the explanation and whether or not it's something that we can um, subsume under the past hypothesis are completely open questions. I think almost everybody um, would acknowledge that. So um, if this is sort of a, a natural moment to ask uh, a question, um, Atai, did you want to um, read out Fredos's question? Happy to, sure. Um, this is, he's quoting from Causation with the Human Face, Jim. There's no well-defined notion of an intervention on the spin state of one of the separated particle pairs with respect to the other in EPR type experiments. This would represent a limitation on the application of an interventionist account of causation, end quotation. So Curtis is asking, would either of you care to address this dilemma if indeed it is one? And he says, uh, he adds, I know we're not discussing quantum mechanics. Jim, did you, since that's from you? I'm happy to, but I think probably you're the well, best. Well, okay. So, so that, just to clarify, that was from a, a paper of mine, also with the title Causation with a Human Face, written, um, I don't know what, 10 or 15 years ago. <laughs> and I don't, uh, uh, at present, subscribe to all of the views about causation in physics that I uh, uh, defended in that paper. Um, uh, the paper is different from the forthcoming book, uh, but I, I, I will try to say a little bit about this and the question of whether this is in some sense a limitation on uh, a broadly interventionist uh, conception of causation. Um, I don't think so. Um, I mean, one of the things that is clear in uh, EPR type setups is that you cannot, by um, uh, intervening on one of the uh, correlated uh, particle pairs, uh, uh, causally influence the um, uh, behavior of the other particle pair. Okay, this is a you know, kind of no, no signaling uh, uh, result. And um, so you don't, you certainly don't want um, uh, the, I would have thought the, the outcome to be that there's or the correct, correct way to think about the situation to be that there's some causal connection between the two separated particle pairs that would, you know, that would violate uh, locality, special relativity, uh, 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 et cetera, et cetera. So if it's right that there's no well-defined notion of an intervention that you can carry out uh, uh, on one of the pairs, then the interventionist account yields the correct answer that there's no causal connection there. So I would see that as a virtue of the interventionist account, not uh, a limitation, but I will defer to the experts on uh, quantum mechanics who, who will know more about this subject uh, uh, than I. I'm in 100% agreement. And it goes very much with the idea that, you know, that causal relations are part of the surface fabric of the world. Um, and they're things that emerge, you know, kind of when you have the right sorts of relations between interventions and outcomes. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly, uh, at least the way I'm thinking about things, uh, and maybe Janan too, that it's an implication of this whole way of thinking about causation is that there may very well be physical systems for which uh, the kind of causal analysis that we're, you know, 
employ in uh, uh, other kinds of contexts is just inappropriate because the preconditions for the application of that kind of reasoning just aren't present in the systems in question. So another question I thought we might discuss, Janan, unless someone else wants to jump in and uh, uh, discuss. I don't, um, I don't see anything, Jim, so go ahead and proceed, yeah. So you and I are both, uh, I think, self-identified pragmatists of one variety or another. Um, could you say something, Janan, about what your version of, what, what are the distinctive commitments of your version of pragmatism? And how does that, how does it contrast with other sorts of possibilities? I'm not, you know, I'm not sure that I have any definite take on what sort of pragmatist I am. I tend to think that, you know, we're natural creatures in a natural world. Our minds were made us allowed to, our, our minds were made to allow us to cope, not copy, as Rorty famously said. And so many of the notions that we use to represent the world, even the ones that are kind of psychologically most basic for us in, in, in terms of how we represent the world, are just part of a user interface that was designed to optimize our chances of getting around um, in, to feeding and mating opportunities. So in that sense, I'm a pragmatist. That sort of pragmatism, I think, is just a consequence of naturalism. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one I was driven to, you know, you know, it's not, it was never a first principle for me. It was more one that I was driven to just by trying to understand how to fit creatures into creatures like us into the world as it's described by physics and to reconcile the kind of manifest image of the world with the image that physics presents to us. Um, so that that's the way that I think of it. Also, I mean, something else that, that you've brought up that, that I think is right, which is, um, you know, the need to bring the subject back into description when we're trying to understand even the most basic notions that we use to describe the world. And I mean, sort of in physics, I think this becomes clear. So I come at from a very, you know, I started out being a fundamentalist about physics, thinking, you know, the world is the way that physics describes it. But there are all these problems coming up in physics, you know, places where some feature of the world, some feature of our experience of the world or the first person perspective of the world or the everyday common sense view of the world that's somehow not locatable or findable in the in the view of the world as it's described by physics um and in all of those cases or all of the ones right. that i've and also janan i mean even this fundamental thing right with quantum physics which is the sort of the the alleged clean separation between the subject and the object the observer and the observed you know, when that gets disrupted as well, right? <clears throat> right, 100%, yeah. So one finds that the, the attempt to give a sort of God's eye view of the world fails in ways that demand that you bring the subject back in. So I, I had a question that um, for both of you, um, you know, this question about, I've been thinking about the uh, modularity that Jim mentioned, right? That you can restrict yourself to a certain level, macroscopic level about, you know, I think it was the Karanoff uh, quotation that you said, you know, you don't know, need to know QCD to understand how the bulldozer works. But I mean, is that reflecting something? Uh, is that reflecting that the laws of the, does it, is reductionism somewhere in there? about, you know, as a feature of the laws. I mean, is that what it's about? Um, Are you asking Jim? Yeah, yeah. well, um, so I, I, I mean, I'm not sure quite what you mean by reductionism, but I, um, I'm, I mean, the way I think about it is that it's, it, it, it isn't that I, I'm not, and I assume this is the way that Kadanoff and et al. would think about it too. It's not as though you have sort of emergent new physics at the uh, bulldozer level or something like that. It's rather more that you just don't have to take into account uh, certain kinds of information uh, to um, uh, model uh, uh, the behavior of the uh, bulldozer. So it's a it's a, a feature of the of the world and our theorizing that we can uh, sort of 
you know, drop certain kinds of information. There's so some epistemic sufficiency. It is sufficient to just know Newton's laws to understand what the bulldozer is doing, and you don't need to know QCD or QED. Right, right. And I think this is this is related uh, to uh, other uh, kind of kinds of generic facts, or, or, or I guess really sort of semi-mathematical facts um, that are uh, they're pertinent here. And uh, I mean, so you, you you can very often have a, a situation with the following kind of structure at a very very fine grain level. Um, some set of variables are uh, relatively highly correlated with one another. But if you coarse grain in the right way, coarse grain the variables, um, you can produce um, outcomes where um, uh, you, you, you have just a, a much smaller uh, number of variables to begin with. And you have um, lots of other stuff just becomes independent as a consequence of the coarse graining. Um, mm. uh, so you, I mean, one of the th things that I see to be characteristic of causal inference is we're exploiting independencies that exist in the world, both, um, statistical independencies and, you know, other kinds of independencies of a more causal character. And the notion of independence is very much a notion that's tied to ideas about level and scale. So something can be um, and, and, and if you're modeling at an incredibly fine grain level, um, it can look as though everything is, is dependent on everything else. As you move to a more coarse grain level, uh, you can get that um, uh, a, a, you, you, get, you get, as I say, a smaller number of variables and you get other stuff uh, in, in a way kind of effectively irrelevant and effective here in, in the sense in which a physicist, I take it, would use um, uh, uh, the notion of... Uh, uh, right, so, I mean, <clears throat> that's where the, this, you know, so this idea of like an effective theory, right? So that you can, you can treat some variables as extraneous um, and then you can, um, uh, you can formulate... Um, you can understand the behavior with a pared down number of variables that are independent, as you said, and that they are sufficient to give you explanatory power, predictive power, uh, uh, and, and so on. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's what I meant when I was trying to say reduction, you know, you reduce yeah, yeah. reductionism in um, sort of an implementation thereof, yeah. Yeah, that, so that's the sort of picture that I have. You're looking for what, um, a statistician would call sufficient statistics, where you, uh, you know you, you have something that is much higher dimensional, and you're trying to reduce it down to a smaller dimension, but the smaller dimension still um, retains the uh, relevant information that you need for uh, understanding the macro behavior that you happen to be uh, uh, interested in. So that that's the that's the general. Uh, uh, general picture that I that I have. And I, I must say that, I mean, philosophers have, uh, of course, all sorts of ideas about theory reduction and so forth. I don't really see that a lot of what the philosophers have to say about theory reduction relates all that closely to what I just described, which seems like it's more the, uh, the, uh, the relevant thing in, in uh, understanding how theories at different levels or scales are related to one another. I see if something else showed up in the chat. Yeah, well, I'm just scanning the chat and um, I don't see any further questions from the audience. Um, so then I guess before we close, are there any final sort of comments or thoughts that uh, both of you would like to share? Thank you for having us. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Very anyway, much. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much to both of you for taking the time and uh, uh, sharing um, your thoughts. And you know, these are very, very uh, important foundational questions. And as uh, our um, audience probably realized that there is no conclusion, final answer. These are evolving in terms of how we think and how we even frame the questions, right? The que how we frame them and pose them.
So uh, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you both on behalf of the Frankie program and the Inference project. And I want to thank the audience for um, being here on a Saturday afternoon. So thanks very much and uh, see you all soon. Bye. Bye, Pierre. Bye, Jim. Bye, thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.